Hello and welcome to the Brian Voice. I'm Randy Seaver. We're continuing our series in Paul's epistle to the Romans, and before we leave chapter 2 and, and get into chapter 3, I'd like for us to consider just a few more exegetical issues that we find in this passage and how these verses link together. As you recall, the, the overall teaching of the apostle in this passage is that the standard of God's judgment is an impartial standard. The standard of God's judgment is a righteous standard. God judges according to truth. God is not a respecter of persons. That means God does not judge one person on one basis and another person on another basis. It was not that Israel had one standard of judgment and the Gentiles have another standard of judgment, as we're going to see. Uh, but every person is going to be judged according to the revelation that God has given to him or to her. Now, before we get into that any further, I'd just like to talk about the way in which Paul links verse 13 with verse 16. I think that's the most um, uh, logical way to look at the, the passage because it sort of seems abrupt the way verse 16 uh, comes at the end of this particular passage. And so what I, what I think uh, Paul is doing here is in his thought he is linking verse 13 with verse 16 so that it would read like this, for it is not the hearers of the law who are justified before God, but the doers of the law will be justified in the day when God will judge the world by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And that seems to me to be the most uh, easy flow to see in between these two verses. Now, between these two verses, the Apostle Paul is talking about the revelation that God has given to the Gentiles. It is not that uh, the Jewish people understand the law and know the law, and the Jewish people have no understanding of the law whatsoever. As we looked, as we saw in our last video, when Paul says, for when the Gentiles, which do not have the law, he was not saying that the Gentiles have no knowledge of God's righteous requirements at all. What he is saying is the Gentiles, unlike the Jews, do not have the codified law of God, the inscripturated word of God, as did the uh, the Jewish people. As when we get into chapter 3, Paul is again going to ask the question, what advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there in circumcision? And his answer is chiefly, uh, greatly, because chiefly to them has have been committed the oracles of God. This is the greatest blessing they have had. And so they have a greater revelation from God, and from Jesus' words we know that to whom much is given, of him shall much be required. But it isn't as if the Jewish people, uh, the, the Gentile people, have no understanding of what God requires at all. It, it, isn't, it isn't as if they have no understanding of the law of God. And basically that law, as we've seen before, that law can be stated in two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And depending on the covenant one finds himself under, those two commandments are expanded uh, into into different expressions of those those requirements. In the Ten Commandments, we have those two commandments expanded. It isn't that the Ten Commandments are summarized in those two commandments, but rather the Ten Commandments and everything else in the Old Testament scriptures depends on those two commandments. That is the sum and substance of what God requires. Now, the question that that every covenant answers is how is love to God expressed? How do we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Now, mind you, under the old covenant, not only was it um, an evidence of a lack of love for God for a person to commit adultery or to bear false witness or to murder or one of those ten uh, commandments, uh, commandments in the Decalogue or in the covenant that God made with Israel, but it was an evidence of a lack of love for God to break one of the other commandments that God had given to Israel. We see that in the case of Daniel and these, these three Hebrew teenagers who were presented with a uh, non-kosher food to eat, and the king said, you know, you need to eat this, and they said, 
the law forbids us to do so. Why did the law forbid them to do so, and why did they refuse to do so? And the answer is because to do so would have shown a lack of love for Yahweh, their covenant God. Now, as we saw in the case of Peter and um, his experience prior to going to the house of Cornelius, uh, Jesus has now cleansed all of these different kinds of non-kosher foods so that now nothing is common or unclean. We may eat freely of that which God has given. And Peter was again showing his lack of understanding of this at Antioch when uh, these Judaizers came down from Jerusalem and he withdrew himself and stopped eating non-kosher food as he had been doing, knowing full well that there was nothing wrong with eating this non-kosher food. And Paul said, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. He, and then Paul says, you are denying the gospel we've been preaching. Now, what has changed? Has God changed? Have his demands changed? And no, the answer is no. What has changed is the covenant that Peter was now under, the covenant that the rest of the new covenant believers are under. Uh, now, God's moral demands never change. It has always been wrong to commit adultery. Sexual immorality has always been wrong. Bearing false witness against one's neighbor, coveting a neighbor's stuff. These things have always been wrong. Idolatry has always been wrong. And so Paul's not saying there's a different standard for Jews and Gentiles. What Paul is saying is the Jewish, the Gentile people did not have the kind of explicit um, codified law that the Jewish people had. And therefore, uh, God is going to judge those with more light uh, and their condemnation is going to be a greater condemnation. And so Paul is, is talking about in what sense the, Jew, the Gentile people have the law. Because he said that when the Gentiles don't have the law, but by what standard are they then judged? And the answer is, even though they don't have the codified law, they do have a clear understanding of some of the law that God has given they may not have it all right because, of course, as we well know, sin always corrupts everything. And so even their understanding and their consciences are, are going to be defiled because um, sin has twisted their understanding. But, but what Paul is saying here is not that the Jew Gentile people uh, fulfill the law and are able to keep the law as God demands. That is, they do not keep the law perfectly or continuously and out of proper motives as a perpetual thing any more than the Jewish people do. But what he's saying is they do not have the law in its codified form, but they are doing things that are contained in the law, or we could say they are refraining from doing things that are contained in the law. That is, they show a knowledge of the rightness and the wrongness of various human actions and attitudes. They understand that there are certain things that are right and there are certain things that are wrong. How, how is this knowledge given to us and the answer is, it is inborn in us. It is innate. That's why Paul says, they do by nature. And we find this word by nature in other places. And, and what this word by nature means is by birth. We see it later in the chapter where, where he's talking about those who are Gentiles by nature. They are part of the uncircumcision by nature. That is, they are born that way. And so when, when Paul uses this, this word in the Greek, and this is universal throughout his writings, he, he means this is innate in the Gentiles. They know this innately. They know this inherently. They know it because God has revealed it to them by creating them in his image and in his likeness. Now, has that image been completely destroyed? And the answer, of course, is no. Has it been severely marred? And the answer is yes. And so, what we see here in this, this passage is not that the Gentiles are fulfilling the law in a, in a way that God's um, smile could be upon them or God could declare them to be righteous. Uh, 
But what Paul is saying is, even though they don't have the law, they do things that are contained in the law. In every uh, culture, in every society, uh, we find people making laws that are very much like the law of God. Why do they? Why do people just know um, innately that it's wrong to kill another person? Why do they know that it's wrong to lie about another person? Why, why do people know these things? And the answer is because God has made it known to them by creating them in his image. It is innate. It is inborn. And so we've already seen in chapter 1 that it's possible for people to know that God exists and that God ought to be worshipped. And it is on that basis, because they suppress that knowledge, that God holds them guilty or holds them accountable. Uh, there's a, a gentleman on the internet who continues to tell us that uh, his mission in life is to c c counter these horrible Calvinists uh, because he wants to defend the whole idea of human responsibility. And uh, we say, hooray, we agree with you. We want to defend the whole idea of human responsibility. You may have noticed that I've been uh, talking for quite some time about these first two chapters, and, and not yet have I mentioned God's meticulous determinism in which he treat, uh, treats people as if we were robots or as if we were puppets, so that God pulls the strings and we simply move and do whatever God uh, controls us to do. And the reason I haven't talked about that is because I don't believe that. I, I believe that we do exactly what we wish to do most at any given time. We always choose according to our highest inclination. And we do, we choose what we want to do, and we choose what we want to choose. Additionally, you haven't, you haven't heard me denying the whole idea that people have the ability, rational ability, natural ability, to reason that if there is a design, there must be a designer. And the reason I don't deny that is because the scripture clearly teaches that. We have certain remaining abilities, even though we are fallen. Additionally, we have the ability, according to the passage we're looking at now, to know the difference between right and wrong. We know that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And so Paul, Paul writes, uh, even though they don't have the law, they do by birth, innately, the thing, things that are can, contained in the law. And these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Now, we need to talk about that phrase a little bit because it doesn't mean what it has come to mean in our modern jargon. When we talk about a person uh, being a law unto himself, what we mean is he thinks that he does not have any law that is over him and he is the ultimate authority in every action that he commits or every thought that he has. He is a law unto himself. That's not what Paul's saying here. What Paul is saying is that these, these Gentiles who don't have the law, because innately they know things that are right and things that are wrong, and so they are naturally doing right things and, and naturally abstaining from doing wrong things. We, we have that ability. We can be moral beings uh, and act morally. And so Paul isn't saying we can't do that. What he's saying is we, we do things that are contained in the law and we, we perform the function of law for ourselves. In other words, because we know what's right and we know what's wrong, we cannot sin thinking somehow we're going to get away with what we're doing. And then Paul says, their conscience also bearing witness. Notice this knowledge and their consciousness of right and wrong are two separate things. Um, the conscience bears witness to what they know innately. Now, this is Paul's second witness, and Paul's second witness is on the stand and arguing that uh, we do not sin um, ignorantly. We do not break God's law ignorantly as if we had no knowledge of what would please God or what would displease God. It's, it's really amazing, isn't it, that we have these uh, folks in our society today called postmodernists, and uh, they're, they're quite willing to state that there is really no 
absolute standard for right and wrong. There is no ab- there is no absolute standard of truth. Your truth may be one thing, and my truth truth may be another, and your truth may contradict my truth, but I have as much right to my truth, and my truth is as valid as your truth, even though they're contradictory. And that's just foolishness. Um, you may want to believe that you are a six foot four um, Asian woman, even though you look like a five foot nine man. And if you believe that, if that's what you think, then you have a right to your truth, even though I have in my hand a yardstick and I'm going to measure you, and we're going to find out whether you whether or not you're a you're a six foot four woman or in fact, a five foot nine man, because we have an objective standard. But you see, in, in modern society, there really is no objective standard. There is, not only is there no objective standard of truth, there is no sta- objective standard of um, moral behavior. You see, I can't say that what you are doing is wrong um, because we have no standard. And yet, and yet, we, we likely have people in record numbers who are going to therapists to deal with their guilt. Now, they want to call it guilt feelings, because if you have no absolute standard, then there cannot be true guilt. But you can, because grandma told you this, and mom and dad told you this, and the pastor at the church told you that, and, and um, so you've all been bound up by all these rights and wrongs, and... So, you know, you can't be guilty of anything because there's really no absolute standard, but your conscience is gnawing at you and you have these guilt feelings. That means the guilt really isn't there, but you feel like you're guilty. But the truth of the matter is the reason they're going to therapists is because they're guilty. And they're feeling the weight of that guilt because according to this passage, they know the law of God that is written in their hearts. Now, I, the third thing that I want to talk about here is when he talks about the law of God written in their hearts, he's not talking about the law of God written in their hearts in the same sense that he's talking about the law of God written in the hearts of the regenerate so that they desire to do the will of God. It's, it's a different um, reference in this context. And so what Paul what Paul's saying here is, The Gentiles are not without law in the absolute sense. The Gentiles know by birth, by innately, they know there there are certain things right and certain things that are wrong. Okay, let's move on. Um, Let me just talk just a moment about the conscience before we get out of this passage because we need to always remember that the conscience is never a safe guide because the conscience can be wrongly programmed. And yet, it is never safe to disobey conscience. Even if our conscience has been malinstructed, we must obey the conscience as long as we believe the conscience is telling us the truth. If we can become convinced that our conscience has been lied to and has been wrongly programmed and therefore is spitting out wrong wrong information, then we need to go back and reprogram the conscience. But don't trample over your conscience. Don't say, I know grandma told me not to wear lipstick because wearing lipstick is wrong. But I'm going to wear lipstick anyway because that's what I want to do, even though I believe it's wrong to do it. That's what I'm talking about. What you need to do is to examine grandma's basis of authority and re-instruct your conscience. And we're going to talk more about this when we come to uh, Romans chapter 14 and talk about Christian liberty. Uh, Because we, we ought not to trample over our conscience. What we need to do is retrain the conscience. If you have a weak conscience, that is, if you have a conscience that is easily offended, Um, then you need to be careful about how you treat people who have a strong conscience and don't sit in judgment on them. If you have a strong conscience, then you need to be careful how how you treat people with consciences that are easily offended and don't despise them. That is, don't look down on them as if they are nincompoops. Um... And so we need to talk more about the conscience, and as I say, we'll do that 
uh, whenever we get to chapter 14 of, of Romans, because that's an important issue. But, but mind you, it is not safe for us to disobey the conscience. If the conscience is wrong, reprogram it and then act freely. Okay? Now, Paul calls the second witness. The second witness is conscience, and the conscience says, I've told you what you ought to do, and I've told you what you ought not to do. And the question that we are asked as defendants in this case is this, have you always done what you believe to be right? And have you always refrained from doing what you believe to be wrong? That's an important question, and you need to answer that question. And I think if you're honest, and if, if we're honest, we're going to all admit that there have been many times that we have listened to our conscience and trampled right over it and done what we knew or believed to be wrong in terms of our relationship with God. And so the conscience, like the creation, is witnessing against us and telling us and telling the world that we are guilty and in need of justification. Okay, let's move on then. Paul says to the Jewish people, indeed, verse 17, indeed, you are called a Jew. And a Jew, of course, was one who was from the tribe of Judah. Um, in Jesus' day, a Jew was one who lived in Judea, but the, the term had been broadened to refer to the entire Jewish nation. And, and so Paul is talking about the covenant people of God here. You are called a Jew, and you rest on the law. And uh, they had good reason to uh, rejoice that God had given them the law, and God had not left them to grope in pagan darkness, wondering what would please him and what would displease him. They knew full well what would please God, because they had the law, and so they boasted, uh, they were able to boast in that. But more than that, Paul is saying, you are boasting in the fact that you have, are by this covenant that God has given, become the covenant people of God, and you have the law, and you understand what God requires, and you don't have to depend on pagan philosophers who are contradicting one another and saying this is right and this is wrong, and this is good and this is bad, and this is good and this is excellent. No, you have the law of God and because you have the law of God, you know, you know what God requires. What a great privilege that was. And you make your boast in God. You see, there's, there's one, one aspect in which this is a good thing. In fact, we are forbidden to boast in anything other than God. He that boasts, he that, he that um, glories, let him boast or glory in the Lord. And, and so we ought to boast in God in that sense. But what they were doing was boasting over the Gentile peoples as if somehow they were superior to them because they are the covenant people of God and could call God their covenant God. And you know his will. You're not um, groping about again as, as Gentiles uh, doing some of the things or knowing some of the things that God, the law requires and failing to know some other things that God requires. No, Paul says you know his will. How do you know his will? And the answer is, having been instructed, or, or, or you're able to, to approve things that are excellent, and he's talking here not simply about knowing the difference between good and bad, but he's talking about the fine distinction between those things that are good and those things that are excellent. Okay, so they had this thing down, as we used to say, to the gnat's bristle. They understood uh, very clearly what God required and what God considered as excellent as opposed to that which was merely beneficial or good. And you're, you're confident, verse 19, that you yourself are a, a guide to the blind, a light to those who sit in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a, a teacher of infants, a teacher of babes. Of course, Paul, uh, the, the, the God had given the, the people of Israel this task. They were a light to lighten the Gentiles. Um, and, and they were to, in, to, to instruct the Gentiles concerning God. They were to be a, a witness among the Gentile peoples of the world. A mission they failed 
And then he says, and there are four rhetorical questions here. Um, you therefore, verse 21, who teach another, don't you teach yourself? In other words, why don't you practice what you're preaching? Because what God is concerned about is not your preaching, not how well you know the law, how well you're able to teach others the law, how well you're able to sit in judgment on those who disobey the law, but what God is concerned about is your behavior. You who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach a man should not steal. Do you steal? You who say a man should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Now these are fairly straightforward and we have little under difficulty understanding them. But with the fourth one, we may have a little bit of difficulty. And um, I feel a little bit comforted because the commentaries that I have looked at don't seem to understand exactly what Paul had in mind either because what Paul says is you who abhor idols do you rob temples and it's difficult to know exactly what Paul's saying perhaps there were Jew Jewish people who were going into pagan temples and taking out these idols and somehow giving some credence to their validity I, I don't know exactly what Paul had in mind but but certainly what Paul had, has in mind in all of these rhetorical questions is that what these people are preaching and what they are claiming to believe does not match their practice. They are not practicing what they preach. And then he says, You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. I think it's likely that what Paul is doing here is not uh, going back to that Old Testament passage and quoting it uh, as though it's talking about precisely the same thing he's talking about, but I think he's probably in this passage simply alluding to the wording of that passage from Isaiah. Um, the name of God is blasphemed because of your disobedience. Instead of speaking well of God, and instead of glorifying God, he says people are speaking against God because they're looking at your behavior and you claim to know this God, but you're not living as if you know this God. And then he goes on, verse 25, for, for circumcision indeed is profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And therefore, if a circumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? All Paul is saying here is this, not that the Gentiles can keep the law and that their uncircumcision will be considered as circumcision. What he's saying is, if they should keep the righteous requirements of the law, would not they be better off than you who have this right of circumcision but are breaking the law? Because what God requires is not the right of circumcision, but what God requires is your obedience to his law. Okay, so that's, that's the point that Paul's making. And so he, he then talks about, um, even though you have the written code and you have circumcision, verse 20, 27, um, none of that gives you any advantage in terms of justification. Okay, now listen to that phrase. None of that gives you any advantage in terms of justification, in terms of uh, avoiding the wrath of God, being declared righteous. And you don't, that doesn't give you any advantage in terms of justification. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that it doesn't give them any advantage at all. And that's what Paul is going to ask as we begin chapter 3. What advantage then does the Jew have? And you'd expect him, after all of this, to say no advantage at all, wouldn't you? But he says much in every way. And the chief way is that to them uh, were, were um, granted, committed, the oracles of God, that is, the scriptures. That's the, that's the greatest advantage they have, and yet they've blown it. And so he says what God is concerned about, verse 29, 
What God is concerned about is not what this this outward circumcision, this ritual that's been performed. What God is concerned about is the inner person. What God is concerned about is this obedience that must flow from the heart. And if, if you don't have that, then you cannot be justified in the presence of God. And if we know ourselves and know ourselves well, we know that we cannot be justified in the presence of God by our own obedience. The problem is not that we can't be moral. The problem is not that we can't know the truth of God. The, the problem is not that we cannot even teach others the truth of God and preach to them they should not steal or kill or commit adultery or bear false witness or uh, have idols that we bow down to and, and all the rest of that. We, we can do that. You see, that when we talk about inability, we're not talking about the inability either to know God as he has revealed himself in creation or to know God's law and what God requires or to have God's written law, codified law, and be able to teach others and condemn them for what they are doing and, and even know that there are certain things we ought to do and ought not to do and be able to judge between the good things we could do and the excellent things. We can do all of that. When we talk about, when we talk about inability, spiritual inability, we're not denying any of that. And now, some, some have written to me and said to me, well, you know, your doctrine doesn't make any sense because right here it says in chapter 1, they can know God. And we agree, yes, in, in the sense that they can recognize that God is the creator, that he's powerful, that he must be wise, and that he is a glorious being who deserves to be worshipped and glorified, etc. Yes, sinners can know God in that sense. What sinners cannot do is refrain from suppressing that truth wherever we find it. As we said in a, the, one of the last couple of videos, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And he who does, everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. So uh, when we talk about total depravity or total inability. We're not talking about the inability, uh, rational inability, natural inability, because we have that. We're able to reason. And, and because we're able to reason, we are held responsible to reason. Because we are able to reason that God must be, we are held responsible, accountable to worship the God who is. Okay, so that's, that's really, I think, the teaching of chapters 1 and 2 of Romans. Now, in chapter 3, we're going to get into that um, sort of parenthesis in verses 1 through 8, where, where Paul asks the question, which probably he's thinking about coming from the mouth of a detractor that says, but what if some, one did, some did not believe? Is God, un, is God unfaithful if there are unbelievers? And we're going to talk about that, that whole um objection in our next video, Lord willing. But I, I think we've fairly well covered chapters 1 and 2, and we've seen that Paul's primary point is that Jews and Gentiles are all in need of the righteousness of God. That is, the revelation of God's method of putting sinners right with himself. Paul is going to give us his summary statement, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 3. And uh, then we're going to get into the whole matter of justification and how we are able to be justified freely by his grace, even though, even though all, both Jews and Gentiles, are failing or, or have sinned and are failing and falling short of the glory of God. How can we be just before God? That's the question that we must ask. How, how can a man, how can a man, a sinner, a person who is suppressing the truth of God, who is failing to glorify God, failing to worship God, failing to acknowledge that God has given us all things that are good, uh, deciding that we don't want to have God in our knowledge because he is not worth knowing, how can that kind of sinner be just before God? That is the burning question that we're going to be looking at. And um, I think it'll be helpful 
not only for those unbelievers that might watch these videos, and I hope there are some, and I hope that God uses these, these truths that are presented in the gospel, in the book of Romans. I hope that God will use these truths to open your heart and enable you to embrace him in love and adoration and worship. Um, God can do that. I don't care how hard you are. I don't care how far you've gone in sin. I don't care where your sin has brought you. God will will take you back. There was a commercial some time ago from a, for a major hotel chain, chain, and the commercial went like this. We do everything we do because we want you back. And I think that's really what the Trinity is saying to fallen sinners. We do everything we do because we want you back. And the reason God doesn't simply say that and does not simply make a provision is not because God's not willing to take you in. The problem is because you're not willing to go in. So that if you want to go in, if you want to return, if you want to embrace the Savior as he has embraced you in his free offer of the gospel, then there is evidence that God has already begun a work in your heart because you would not want him if he didn't want you. That's a clear teaching of the scripture. Charles Spurgeon said in his book, All of Grace, if you will have Christ, he has you already. And I tell you, you cannot go to hell for that would be to make the sacrifice of Christ of none effect. Do you want him? Do you have a hunger and thirst after righteousness? Well, that didn't come from your nature. What that must mean is that God is already working in your heart to bring you to himself. What an encouragement that ought, that ought to be to you. But even if you don't have that desire, even if you are still a high-handed rebel against the God of heaven, the gospel is clear to you. Repent and believe the promise of God. And on the basis of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, he will justify you freely from all things for which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Well, until next time, may God richly bless you.